Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's my guest host, Stephanie McGann Jansen. I am Stephanie McGann Jansen, and I am so pleased to be joined here by Terry Woolman live in studio. If you are here in the studio audience with us, Welcome to Fireside, and if you are listening off-platform, we welcome you to the show as well. We would love to have you in the show next time with us, so if you have not downloaded the Fireside chat app, please do so on all iOS and Android devices in your app stores. I want to welcome Terry Woolman, who is a fantastic friend of mine. I'm honored to call friend, and Terry, just yesterday, um, his new album was released globally. The title of that album is Surface, and it has a fantastic story. The creation, the formation, the collaboration during an unprecedented time in our history and some of the fantastic music that came out of that album. Uh, Terry is joining us here live in studio. And Terry, we are right now listening to one of those top hits from that album, What is Hip? There's a great story about that too, but let me do a quick introduction, Terry, and then we'd love to hear from you. Terry Woolman, originally from Miami, was formally educated in Boston, graduating with a bachelor's degree in arranging from the prestigious Berklee College of Music. Soon after arriving in Los Angeles, Terry built a solid reputation as an in-demand session guitarist and producer, contributing to all styles of music from jazz to pop, rock, blues, R&B, and beyond. An accomplished and versatile producer, composer, and musician, Terry has commanded such diverse projects, touring, producing, recording, and performing with renowned artists including Melissa Manchester, Keb Moe, Joe Walsh, Tony Bennett, Dick Van Dyke, Alan Bergman with Dave Krusen. It's actually Krusen. Sorry about that, Dave. <laughs> Mindy Abair, Wilson Phillips, Al Jarreau, Billy Preston, Gerald Albright, and Eartha Kitt, to just name a few. Terry Woolman and Mango Eater Music Productions is a one-stop music production and music library company specializing in world-class music for recording, film and television, concerts, tours, and special events. There's so much more, Terry, to say about you, but we're going to land that plane there because I think we could go on forever. And so again, Terry, welcome. And I want to be the first to congratulate you. I'm probably not the first, but I'll say it here live <laughs> on Fireside. The first on Fireside to congratulate you for the success of what is an album that was created with an amazing story behind it. We're going to talk about that today. Um, honored to call you a friend and a fellow Fireside creator. So Terry, welcome. And um, again, congratulations. Thank you. This is a very exciting time. And it's so great to launch the record with you on our format. Thank you, Terry. I'm very honored. I, I want to give you a quick minute to talk about the song that we introduced the show to that we played in the background, because What is Hip is a single song on that album, but it's got a fantastic story unto itself. So tell us a little about a little bit about What is Hip and where did that song come from? And maybe there's a little bit of remaking in it. Tell us about it. There is. It's, it's the one song on the record that I did not write. Uh, and it's a song that has deeply influenced me as an artist as just as a fan of Tower of Power. It's it's a Tower of Power hit. Uh, it just and Terry, its... very quickly, for those people who may not know who Tower of Power is, yes, there are people who don't. <laughs> so who is Tower of Power? Tower of Power is an Oakland-based group uh, that just celebrated their 50-plus year reunion. Uh, I actually just had them on my show, and that interview will be out soon. So I look forward to That's sharing it with awesome. everybody to celebrate their, I think they're at 55 years right now, but it was 50 year anniversary of of What Is Hip. Uh, that song is one of the reasons I became an arranger. I, you know, I just always loved horns and funk, you know, and soul music. And they combine the best of, of all of those qualities and, and elements. And it's a kind of a full circle. There are many full circle moments in this record for me, but with Tower of Power, the horn section played on my very first record, Bimini, in 1988. And I flew up to San Francisco uh, where they were located and did the horn date with them. I had written two horn arrangements. So, so to go circle back and reach out to them again to say, I am going to record one of your songs on my next record. I, I would love your permission and blessing. And they were very happy to hear that I was going to do that. And they gave it to me. And and uh, and even more importantly, after the song was recorded, 
I sent it to them to listen to, and they absolutely embraced it and loved where I took the song, you know, because I really wanted to find a way to make it my own and still honor the original. So it was a really exciting song to re to record. It's actually the first song that got recorded for this record. And the reason being, I had already started writing music for the record and I was working on the arrangement for this song, had figured out what I wanted to do with it. And Will Lee, bass player and dear friend, was going to be visiting LA with his wife from New York and just reached out to us and said, hey, I'm gonna be here let's get together for a coffee and, and catch up. And, and I said, would you like to play on a song? I've got an idea. And he said, yeah, I'd love to. I told him what song. So we got together and recorded bass and drums live. I had already recorded my guitar parts here in my studio and it was an, and put down some drum loops and then went there. We, Will and I drove to the studio together to John Robinson's studio in, in LA recorded bass and drums live with Steve Sykes Engineering. And then about a week later, this virus came up over the news where it said, everybody needs to be careful and mindful. We're not sure what's going on. And the world promptly shut down. So that was that for live recording for the whole rest of the album and for the next couple of years for the entire music community globally as well. Um, so... At that point, I, I had sent the tracks to Luis Conte, my percussionist, who I record with. And he recorded, we've done this before, where he added percussion from home. And then uh, standstill on the whole record. There was, I didn't know what to do or how we would continue. And it stopped. And it stopped for a while. And then I just felt this need, this desire, this hunger to continue to figure out how to remain creative and productive while we were all trying to figure out how to not get sick, how to not die, how to take care of our, our friends, our family, you know, keep a roof over our head and food in the fridge. But, but we, my f other artist friends and non artist friends, everybody just, there was a, a state of sadness that was lifting into everybody's daily psyche you know, fear and sadness. And we should mention the fact that your wife, Melanie Taylor, is also an artist. Yeah, she's a touring musician. So, we so have, she's been your touring entire her household, whole life. Yeah. Your entire household yeah. shut down. And it's not yes. like you're now doing something remotely to even make money. I mean, right. you're entertainers. And so whether that's in studio with other artists or whether that in Melanie's case is touring, your entire family just shut, literally shut down. Um, Absolutely. Which Absolutely. is terrifying, right? Some of us had, some of us were doing jobs that were easy to go remote. Mm -hmm. um, no problem, but not, not the case for you and, uh, and Melanie. So, so Terry, the album, you knew you were making an album. This was not just a one hit where you reached out to Tower Power and said, I right. just want to do a remake of this song. You had plans for an entire album. Yes. At that point, had you already decided what musicians you were going to collaborate with, or did that change based on individual musicians' capacity to participate remotely? We're going to dive more into how you all figured that out yeah. to do this. But how did did you have to shift in terms of the talent you brought into the album because of that remote environment, or what? How did that? Yeah. What transpired? It's a great question. That? Yes, I already knew the musicians who I was going to be mostly working with. I also knew that the intention of this record for me was going to be more collaborative. I really wanted, I mean, I always collaborate. I surround myself with greatness. You know, I think any great leader does. Anybody who's a smart leader in business, music, life, brings the best of the best to support them. And, and, and so I knew who I had wanted to record with because I've recorded with these musicians before in my previous albums. But the, the list grew. It didn't diminish, it grew when, when we realized, when I realized that the only way to do this was remotely and that putting it off for an unlimited, you know, an indefinite amount of time, it might never get done, you know, because, you know, this seemed at the beginning that this was going to last more than a couple of months. And then we found out that it was going to last a couple of years. So, so 
it meant that a lot of my peers around the world were also experiencing the same loss, the same frustration, the same hunger and desire and, and need to connect and create. So the list grew because more people were sitting at home available and, and desiring to, to figure out ways to do this as well. So when I would reach out to them, basically I, I, it, was, it was a welcome invitation from anybody I reached out to. Okay, so it's not like we don't have the technology in place to make something like this happen. Mm -hmm. which is studio musicians doing their own tracks in their own studio, sending right. MP3 files, whatever that looks like. Yes, we've done that before. Done it before. But not completely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about to say that. So two, mind, two great minds think alike. That's what I was about to say, is the entire process hadn't happened because it didn't have to happen. You typically had studio musicians who would go together. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a vibe that happens when you're in person as a musician versus creating in your own home or your own studio. Um, the music can even sound different when you're around your other musicians on the same song. It, there's just, there's, Absolutely. there's an energy and a vibe. And before you answer that question that I was going to ask you, which relates to how did you figure out how to do this holistically? Um, to create such fantastic music. But I think I want to back up just a little bit. I think for people who are not, I mean, I think some people would say, well, you're a musician if you're learning the piano or you're a musician if you play the violin. But let's talk about what it is to be a professional musician and what your profession is to you on a soul level. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. I like what I do for a living. It wouldn't throttle me if I couldn't do it for a couple of years. Mm. My, and my point in saying that is that my creative outlet can tend to be podcasts and other places. Um, from back in my past history, I had, of course, a musician background, but Terry, for musicians as proficient and prolific as you and the people that you invited to collaborate here on this album, and I love the term collaboration, what does it mean for you to not be able to create? I mean, you can certainly play an instrument in your house, but what happened to you as a professional musician that impacted you as a person when it Wait. sort of went shut down and you couldn't create? Because not everybody is a musician and not everybody can appreciate what that does to you, your, your mental fitness, your psychological fitness, your wellness when that creation and certainly for Melanie, right? Live performing mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. live perform too, my, mind you, you, you live perform as well. What happened to you on a psychological mental level? What did that look like? And I'm guessing you went through a phase where you finally said, damn it, we're going to do this album. We're going to figure it out. That's right. What did that process? I, well, it, what it looked like the image that comes to my mind as you're asking the question is a plant withering from not being watered, a plant slowly dying. My my spirit was diminishing. It was getting <clears throat> it was getting smaller. Like I just felt I I felt the sadness creeping up. Uh, you know, even not being able to go to the gym, you know, and and stay as physically active as I'm used to. We I've had to find a different way to do that. You know, walking outside and lifting weights at home and stretching and yoga and and it still wasn't quite the same. Um, but but as a musician, I felt like I was drying up. And, and I didn't like the way it made me feel. Because for me, to have music taken away from me is a profound loss. Because it's not just a job. It, it enriches me. It, it fills me. Um, it allows me to express myself. But, but it's a creative life force for me to do that. And, and I know that because I've had music taken away from me before due to physical injury. You know, I had an, an accident many, many years ago. It was a bicycle accident and almost broke my neck and I couldn't play guitar for a year. And I slowly had to work my way back from that. And I still have numbness in both of my hands from that, you know, a permanent non-visible disability, that same kind of thing. I, I already had an experience where, where for me, I learned from that experience that, well, if my hands are numb, they're going to always be numb whether I 
play guitar or don't play guitar. So I might as well figure out how to do that again and figure out a new way to do it. So, and it was a long, slow climb there. You know, I, I would play for five minutes a day and then it would make the condition worse. So I'd go down to three minutes and then I would bump it up and slowly work my way back to where I am today to be able to play. So it was a familiar experience in a, in a whole different way. But I felt myself drying up spiritually, creatively, um, emotionally. And for me, when I don't get to, to create, I get sad. You know, I, it, the creativity is displaced by, you know, low-grade depression and sadness. Yeah, yeah. Not uncommon with most of the artists. I can't, you know, speak for all of them. Right. But it was a shared uh, experience. We were sad. Right. No, I, I appreciate that. And so, hungry. Right, absolutely. So COVID hits California. You and I both live in California. Lockdowns were about the middle of March. Um, and we stayed Walk me through the timeline of when you said, all right, we're doing this. It's obviously going to be an indefinite, indefinite amount of time. I want to do this album. I want to collaborate. So what was the month-ish that you said, all right, let's 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 pull it together. We're making this album. We're going to kill it. Um, any technology we don't have or any you know background production stuff that we're going to need how did you pull this whole album off? And when did you finally kind of pull up your bootstraps again and say, okay, I've been sad, this has sucked, and now we're going to hit it, and we're going to hit it hard, and we're going to get excited about it. This yeah. is how it's going to happen. Y'all get your head around how you're going to do it, and off you go. So had some time passed? Are we heading into like cutting the turkey at Thanksgiving? Or what? at what point, at what point yeah. were you like, let's go? <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a gradual transition back in. It was dipping my toe in the water. It was, I, I began by crawling and then got up on my knees and then got to walking yeah. and then got to running. And and so it happened, you know, this album was, what what it started with, it didn't start with we, It's it started with I. I needed to figure out how to continue to create on my own. So I, I kept writing. I thought, well, let me write another couple of songs. Okay. Let me keep writing. And when you say writing. Composing. Composing, right? Yes. Composing. So you're doing music and lyrics. Yes. Music and lyrics. Okay. Or music for just the instrumental songs, because there are okay. three vocal songs on the record. Right. And the, and the others are instrumental tunes, contemporary, okay. pop, jazz, okay, whatever anybody wants to call it. Okay. So I knew that I could do that myself. So I forced myself. You know, I used my my discipline that I've learned from being a self-employed musician, which yeah. takes a lot of discipline and dedication, and also having a background as a martial artist. I've learned how to just buckle yeah. down, put my nose down and get it done. You know how to do that as well. Yeah. You know, Although that's not oftentimes everybody's creative process. Some people have the flexibility to say, I am feeling creative. Yeah. And while I'm feeling creative, I'm going to create. And you said... This is my business. <laughs> yeah. How do you take the discipline of martial arts, which is a discipline, uh, mentally, physically, et cetera, and apply that towards, I'm going to get creative. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you take both sides of those brain, yeah. that your brain, and sort of like commingle them and say, we can, we can do this together. We can be disciplined and we can also be creative. Well, I, I made the goal more manageable. I didn't think about a record. I thought about a song okay, or groups of songs. I thought, why? Well, and I was writing about two or three songs at a time, like kind of okay. developing them. Okay. I was able on my beach walks, you know, when I was getting out, walking three miles in the sand where I could be away from people and yeah. get my heart rate up and yeah. clear my head. And um, But I was writing melodies. I was humming songs and getting ideas and... And so I, I started developing, it was, I don't typically work that way. You know, I work on a song, but I worked on two or three. I would just get these ideas. And then I realized, well, I've, I've got three songs. Let me reach out to my drummer, John Robinson, 
not my drummer, but the, <laughs> he's worked with everybody. And, and most of the musicians on these records have a, a, an extremely uh, deep history, musical history and resume and credentials. But so I reached out to JR. I reached out to Abe LaBoreal, bass player extraordinaire, and to Luis and to Greg Manning, a keyboard player I work with, and asked if they would do some remote sessions with me. And they said, yeah, that would be great. Send them. And I go, okay. They, everybody always, you know, the response immediately is like, great, send it. Right. And I then my response would be, give me a couple weeks to yeah. get it together, you know, to record enough information, since we're not all going to be in the room together, record some guitar parts, some loops, a piano part, enough to get to flesh out the idea, to show my intention of the direction of the song, the way it's supposed to feel. Okay, and so then, you recorded some pieces. Pieces, yeah. That they could then sort of listen to and figure out, do we want to add, do we want to, how do we want to change this? Terry, do you have favorite chords that you just organically tend to create from? You know what I mean? Like everybody has kind of their own like, oh, I, I do admittedly, I kind of usually start from here. Is there is that a thing for you where you've got certain certain chords or notes or that you love and that you just organically tend to start to your creation process from whether you're aware of it or not? Well, I, I try to not always start from that place, you know, to find a new <laughs> right. place. There are, a, I, I do have some favorite chords. I love chords that, you know, for any of the musicians and artists that have a nine in it, you know, it's like okay. a C chord with the second in it, the D, okay. you know, it's like, it just makes it really okay. magical. Um, so those are some of my favorite chords. Okay. Uh, but, you know, something interesting that happened creatively in this record is I was writing chord progressions, like just sitting with the guitar or the piano and experimenting and, and seeing where these ideas would take me without judging them because there was no deadline anymore. And I would just hit, I, I'd hit record on my phone. And what I found was the chord progressions that were revealing themselves to me, these are like treasure hunts when I write, whether I'm writing a lyric, a melody, a chord progression, or writing an orchestral arrangement, writing a horn arrangement or strings, I always go on a treasure hunt. You know, I'm looking for the magic, not what I usually do, what I did before that worked, or or what, um, you know, what would be expected. I'm always looking for the unexpected, and and it, so not trying to be clever just for the sake of being clever, but looking for something again that you wouldn't think would happen at that point in the song. And so I was open. I was open and certainly not distracted, you know, by the usual daily. Totally. Uh, yeah, have to do things because the, those all were, were t peeled away from all of us. So, so I found that, you know, there's something thematically in this album that I found really fascinating. These songs were harmonically, they were going through different key changes. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these songs, even in what is hip, there's a horn break. It goes Absolutely. to a different key. Yep. It just modulates to a different key. And then I worked my way back to the original key. There are a lot of moments like that in most of the songs where, not all of them, but where they would just take me to a new key. And I went, and I would just kind of marvel at that and go, well, that was kind of unexpected. And then I would follow that lead. I would see where it would take me. And that trail would take me, you know, the verse would be in one key, but this chord would take me to another key for the, the pre-hook. And then, then it would take me to another key for the chorus. And then I managed to find, write a melody and a chord progression that would right. take me back to the original key. Right. And that typically doesn't happen for me. So there's a lot, you know, modulations typically you know, you hear it, you know, the gospel choir comes in and yep. everybody goes up a whole step or a third. Right, and right. It's, you know, but that there was sort of this wave of mm -hmm. harmonic change that would, would come to me. And I wasn't quite used to that, but I, I was intrigued. I was very intrigued by it. And you trusted it. it. I trusted it. Because you trusted it, it. Because I like the way it sounded. I like the way it felt. Uh -huh. It was, like I said, it was a little unexpected. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to the songs, you feel it. It doesn't like, you Absolutely. know, knock you over the head. What is hip knocks you over the head with just the totally. energy? Yeah. You know, yeah. that was intentional. Right. The other songs, it just made it more interesting for me. I think I needed to entertain myself a little bit more to, 
to hold my attention to get the song to the finish line with not a lot of motivation except discipline and desire. Yeah. yeah. Hunger. Um, I love that. Yeah. So we're now now when you when you sent off these pieces, these multiple pieces of the song that you hadn't really tied together yet, and your collaborators on this album received them. Yeah. Um what was their how did that process go? Do they just receive it and they start kind of jamming in their house and their, you know, whatever that looks like. And then they go, okay, what about this? What about this? How much collect and uh, other musicians on Terry's album, this is not to make someone sound better than another. Cause that's not my point. But did you have any of your collaborators go, dude, I've got something so cool for where you want to go with that. Or did that happen throughout it? Because again, yeah. when you're sending pieces to people that you're leaving it up to their creative process, whatever instrument they're playing to kind of figure out, okay, I could do something really cool with the drum stair. We could, yes. we, could we could hop and skip here. And then, you know, your bass player might've gone, Oh, cause bass players just tend to go, I hear where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like bass players are that foundation. So did you find, I guess what I'm asking you is, did you find that people just got excited that they were getting pieces of this puzzle? Not that that's never happened before, but everybody was kind of in a place where they're like, I've been sitting around and I'm sick of it. And ooh, I've got some nuggets to work with and I'm I'm about to have so much fun. Like how, how did that happen once you sent everything off? Great question. And and just for clarity, they what they were asking me to send them were more than nuggets. I didn't just send them ideas. Okay. I sent them completed songs okay. with a written chart, but a lot of space for them to insert themselves okay. Okay. into the collaboration. Okay. I didn't overwrite a drum part. I wrote the songs. Okay. And so they understood the form. They understood the arc. Um, okay. And then we would, but here's what was fascinating. It was... There were there were certainly women involved in recording, mm -hmm. um, but it, the main rhythm section was predominantly male, mm -hmm. just because that's just what happens. That that happens to be the people that I work with, mm -hmm. um, and and make great records with, uh, and we count on each other. And we already we already have uh, an understanding of of right. point of view. Yeah, and I trust them completely, and it would be it would be so unnecessary and such a wasted opportunity for me to micromanage their, right. their creativity and their, their experience. So I left a lot of space for them, but here's, here, so it was dialogue. It was conversations like this. So I would send the song to them, okay. like to, to JR and Abraham. Mm -hmm. And then we would decide who should go first mm. on, and each song was different. Every song has a different story. There was not a single method or methodology right, that process. happened. Yeah. Process. Everyone required a deeper level of communication, conversation, with people asking me questions just like, well, what are you feeling for this? Or what's your intention? Or mm -hmm. how, you know, I'm thinking about this. We would, we would brainstorm some ideas you know, maybe brushes or sticks, or mm -hmm. I want a big symbol that's really beautiful and, and resonant, or I want this to be really balls out in your face, you know, those kind of things. But essentially, I sent them an, enough of a fleshed out arrangement with a lot of space in it for them just to really know exactly where they were going to fit and give them the opportunity to decide what they wanted to do and they all came back to me, oh, I'm gonna do this and this and then this, but on this song, Abraham should lay his bass down first. I'll okay. do drums second. Or or JR would say, oh, I definitely wanna play drums first on this. I know exactly where we need to take this, so I'll go first. Those kind of conversations with the rhythm section. Um, and, and again, every song required or invited a, a different, conversation with whoever was going next. You know, uh, the song Gratitude and Attitude, uh -huh. the opening song on the record features yeah. Bob James. Thank you. And that came about from, I was already, I had already started writing the song and I was interviewing Bob James on my podcast, on this network, <laughs> on this awesome. format, on Fireside. And, and Bob made a comment that he was just alone, you know, playing to the squirrels, literally because his house is off in the woods and oh, he's he's isolated and really it's a beautiful isolated. property, but very yeah. isolated. Great for him because he's touring all the time and then he comes home to recharge, but he was definitely 
in a quiet spot. And he showed me, you know, he pointed the camera and I could see the plate glass window where the piano was and, yeah. you know, little animals looking in and listening to the piano. <laughs> wow. So he said, I'm just looking for, you know, something to do. I'm practicing and I'm writing, but it's not the same. And I just said, well, I have a song for you. And he said, oh, well, that would be great. And so, and then I c continued on with the interview because the interview was not for me. <laughs> right. It was about him. It's not about me. Terry, so, why don't you play? Why don't you play a minute of gratitude and attitude? Because okay. um, I think it's also fun through the eyes yes. of the composer musician to sort of like play a piece of it and then walk through as you're telling these stories. Yeah. Okay. Just as an example, it's a beautiful song. Okay. You turn it up just a little bit. Yep. So let me pull it down and I'll tell you as we're listening. It's so, um, if you really listen to each individual, was this always going to be a good, was the guitar always going to be? The melody, the feature? Yeah. It was, but when Bob played, I took some of my guitar out so I could feature him on the melody in the second verse. There you go. Yeah. So, so everything shifted. It was all about following the magic and following the conversation. So... Um, right. after, after the podcast, I was speaking to Bob, thanking him. And I said, by the way, were you serious about the song? Cause I am. And he goes, yeah, send it to me. I said, give me a couple weeks so I can hear. So I kicked it to Bob. Cause this was so beautiful. It didn't need my guitar. I'm still playing the electric rhythm guitar. Okay. Then I come back in to join him. So now we're in unison. Got it. That wasn't in the original plan. That happened because of what he played, and then I responded to that. It was just not in real time, like it would be when you're playing live. So, But Bob had asked, he said, well, we're, what else is going to go on this? And I told him who was going to be playing, and he said, okay, well, that sounds great. You know, now I know what to do, so... I said, I'd like you to play acoustic and electric piano. And I'll add some, I'll add another guitar part and, you know, some more, some colors and layers, like right here. There's all these volume swells. Yeah. And there's a key change. There's this this song has goes through three keys every time and then comes circles full back around. Kind of like life. You know, it was I I was channeling, I think. I mean, I I'm a believer and many of the artists who I work with follow the same point of view. It it comes through us. We're vessels. Totally. Of of, of art, of information and and so yes, I when creativity comes you know, when this great inspiration comes, yes, I stop and, and I, I love that part of the process and I'll get up out of bed. There's another song on the record that I dreamt, you know, um, literally dreamt, uh, which is Dancing in the Light. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I love that song. That, that came about completely from a dream. And then I reached <laughs> out to Ricky Kej, a three-time Grammy-winning artist who lives in India. He's Indian. And... You know, I, I had this idea of, it wasn't an idea. I had the whole, like, feeling. The melody wasn't completely fleshed out yet, but the, but the whole arrangement, the idea, the arc, I woke up with this idea. And it was half Indian musicians, sitars and tablas and all these beautiful so instruments, cool. and American musicians, you know, a, a, a East meets West, you know, collaboration. And Terry, would this album have sounded... Very no. different. Yes. Had it, it not been COVID. Yes. It would have It would have. It's better. Yeah. It, it's we we actually I mean it's part of the, the the essence of the title of the record service, but we really did take a deep dive into 
our spirits and our mm-hmm. creativity. To, we had to dive deep to tap into it because it was we were out of practice on how right, to connect right. and, and how to play. And, you know, we, we understood how to overdub and send tracks to each other. But sure. you usually, you you will be in a room recording a live song with everybody, and then you send the track to somebody to add a flute part. Mm-hmm. Or you or you add the orchestra at, on, on a different day. But, but people are still in, in groups in the room together. So this has a... This whole album, to me, in listening to it, when we were mixing it, um, we really could feel it as it was all really being put together, balancing the levels of each of the instruments and everything, and and fine-tuning the final product. It has such a a different layer of depth to Mm -hmm. it. And I always go deep in my records, but it's deeper. It's deeper in a different way because, uh, you know, here's a bunch of guys, typically not communicators. You know, it's a it's a woman's gift. To, We're brushing with a broad stroke, but we know that this is true. <laughs> yes, mostly. not to generalize, and and I'm right. I'm I'm pretty communicative guy, yeah. and yeah. and yeah. But but the the basic essence is when you're with your guy buddies and stuff, you don't generally talk like girls do when they get together. <laughs> right. And and I and I see it as a gift that women have that that. Um, any man who's um, has a good sense of himself, it, you know, invites those traits into his world to make yeah. himself a better human and person. But it it sometimes takes more work. It it's totally a broad stroke on on the human condition. But but I did notice that here I was having deep conversations with people one at a time, which is very luxurious. For sure. People don't generally have the time no. having either Zoom or phone dialogues about the song. And then each of these musicians would send me their parts and then say, what do you think? Is there anything you need to change? Or sometimes it would be, don't change a note that I played. I totally mm. understood where you were going. Oh, interesting. Please don't change anything. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, so then, well, then here's the, uh, what, what it feels like kind of an obvious next question is, did creating, collaborating, co-creating, has this process changed for you forever? Yeah. Do making this album, frankly, being forced into a new way to collaborate. Yes. And have and and do you think, wow, this is a next level in terms of what we ultimately produced, and I'm probably going to stick with this. Now, it doesn't mean you won't be in the same studio with musicians. That's not what I'm suggesting. But in mm-hmm. terms of that process, are you more interested in doing more international style music in the future? Because yeah, you made absolutely. it happen, right? Where Absol- you've got different types of instruments and different influences. Absolutely. And I think that changed for all of us. We all realized that we had to broaden our skill set technically, Mm -hmm. you know, with the technology, uh, but also with our, the sense of intimacy that is created very organically when you're on a stage performing live music and there's the energy of the audience or when you're in a studio and there's the energy of each of you on the edge of your seats, you know, making this music and responding to each other in just these and and facial expressions and smiles or laughter or you know a sparkle in somebody's eye all of that stuff when that's all stripped away and you have to f- to learn how to find that sense of connection which is intimacy as well you don't throw that away after the experience because it's such a magnificent experience right. it will absolutely be incorporated into all of our continued work I don't think any of us are ever going back to just recording live in a studio and not tapping in to the opportunity that we discovered that I I had a shovel and a you know and a sledgehammer to to find that yeah you know to dig uh, to to find that but then we all we did all share that collectively like the the conversation became very familiar to me. And when yeah. somebody would say something like that, this is so great, or I'm so glad that we did this, or 
it feels like we actually really like we're in the room together. How did you get the bass and drums and percussion? This, you know, I feel like we're recording it together. And I said, we're, I'm hearing that from each of us because we're all figuring it out together. Right. And it's, and it's, it was a beautiful experience that in my job as a producer is to capture moments in time. You know, for me, that's perfection in a record. It's not everybody playing the exact right note. You know, there's always, to me, there's always beauty. You know, you hear in pop tunes when somebody's right. Michael Jackson voice cracked in the sure. very last note of, of a song and, and that's, there's the yeah. magic. Right. It's real. Yeah, it's real. So all of this is real. I captured a lot of truth in the very, record. Very cool. So there is, there's a particular song on the release of this album that is actually quite personal for you. And when I say the song is personal for you, I mean, of course you had other musicians that were participating in the creation of the music of it, but the words and the song there that, that are also part of this album, there's one particular one based on a very, um, very hard time in your life. And I'm guessing I can't even fathom for you the, I mean, probably a combination of joy of this album, the creativity that ensued from the album, but then combined with some very raw and in some cases unpacking some things through song that you hadn't done before. I mean, I would imagine you were both exhilarated and exhausted. Um, it's a lot. And so we're going to, we're going to have another podcast, um, for you that we're going to dive more into that story. Cause I think it's worth telling, but for the sake of this conversation, yes. do, would you like to talk about that song, um, yeah. at a higher level in terms of what, the, what, and then, and then why it was a part of this collaboration? I, I would. And thank you for, for creating a space for me to do that. That song is called the secret. And it's a song that when I, before COVID, but certainly when we hit COVID and, and we had time to think about things, I, this is a song that I wrote many years ago that I never released and never recorded. I did a demo of it when I wrote it. I played piano, a friend of mine sang it, and it was sitting on a cassette tape. But it was a song that I always felt was a really important song uh, because it's a song of empowerment. And it's a, it's a song that was um, written based on an experience of, of me having a traumatic experience and keeping a secret about it. So the, the song was written after I had an experience of, of going to therapy and, and, and talking about it and, and realizing that I needed to write about it. And I wrote about it. And it released me from the shackles of keeping something a secret that didn't need to be kept a secret. And as you know, there's the whole Me Too movement and, and I have been watching for years, um, but more and more um, in the last couple of years and even more so during COVID where, where there are a lot of celebrities and high profile people, people who have a, a podium to make a statement, to use their voice. And they're coming out and they're courageous about it. They're coming out with saying, something bad happened to me and I'm not going to keep it a secret anymore. Yeah. You know, and I think they're doing it, they're, they're doing it personally, but I, I wanted to be a part of that conversation. And I, and even when I was starting to think of the songs on the record before I started recording, it, it was something I thought I, it's time for me to release this song. I need to brush it off and revisit it and find it and record it and make it beautiful make it as beautiful as I can make it and, and let that story live so that hopefully it will touch some, somebody else who is experiencing some form of trauma or abuse and let them know that there's a way out of that door. So I recorded it uh, and I you know, shared the lyrics with each of the musicians who played on it right. so that they understood the intention of the song. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Secret. My wife... Melanie Taylor sang it beautifully for me. Uh, I played acoustic guitar. Beautiful. Uh, there's one of my favorite guitar players in the world, Michael Thompson, who's a, a major session uh, musician, played on every hit ever written pretty much. And 
as many of these guys on the record do. Yeah. And Michael and I, here's another example. Um, we had said, we, Michael had said, we should record together sometime because guitar players don't generally get to record together. Yeah. I said, that would be great. I'd, I'll find an opportunity. And and I started recording my electric guitar parts and, and I thought, oh, this would be perfect for Michael. Let me reach out to him. It's again, each right. song had a story uh, that, that propelled the direction of how it was going to right. unfold in the production of it, the recording. So I sent it to Michael and he added so much to the arrangement, you know, and he's a, he's a big fan of, of Melanie's voice also. They've they worked together for years. How could you not be? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But they have their own personal friendship too. And, yeah. and then I brought in Ron Walters Jr. on, on acoustic piano who plays, he's Barry Manilow's music director and magnificent musician, but he, Melanie and, and, and Ron tour together with Barry Manilow, Abe Laboreal on bass, John Robinson drums, Luis Conte. And here's another thing about it. I wrote a, a trumpet quartet, a brass quartet, which is not typical. Um, and there's another song where there's a cello quartet. Usually you have a string right. quartet, but it was the same kind of thing. Well, you know, it's hard to get four people in the room together, but one person can, if it's the right person, can play all four parts right. and blend with themselves. Um, and yeah, yeah. so so Wayne Bergeron, who, who played trumpet and flugelhorn on What is Hip, after we did that, Wayne said, that was really fun. Let's do another one. <laughs> and I said, there isn't another one. He goes, well, write something. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I'm serious. Let's just, this was great. Let's wow. do it. So it was very unexpected because that was a big undertaking to, to record a whole horn section oh, for what is hip. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's 10 horns oh. in, in the arrangement. In addition to Andy Snitzer playing the, the, lead, the alto sax melody and solo. All remote. All remote. All remote. Everybody oh. remote. So I thought, well, let me find something. And then I thought, I could write a, a brass quartet for The Secret. It would be orchestral and beautiful. And, yeah. And so I did. That wouldn't have existed. I wouldn't have even thought to do that. You know, and then I sent it yeah. to Wayne. And then out of that came another piece at the end of the album, which is basically a reprise of The Secret. Yeah. Featuring the quartet, or, you know, the brass quartet arrangement. Yeah. So um, I could play a little bit of that for a moment just so. Yeah, absolutely. So people can hear what we're talking about. Yeah, please. And, and I actually, I wrote a prelude as well. So let me play a little bit of the prelude. Absolutely. Which again, it was just because Wayne said, write me something. Yeah. And he's one of the top trumpet players in the world. Oh, that's the reprise. Here's the prelude. So trumpet and guitar, and then it goes to a quartet. Let me fast forward. And it now leads into the intro to The Secret. So that transition, that music wouldn't have existed. Oh, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. You know, it, that sound reminds me of a score written for a film. Yeah. 
I mean, it really feels like I can close my eyes and imagine that being the opening. I mean, I really can. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Terry. Yes. How does it feel to have this album now out great. and available to download? It feels like, great. It's there. <laughs> Yesterday was um, National International Surface Day uh, in our home. It was just really, it felt really good. I, you know, I'm excited. I'm deeply excited to share this music with the world and, and so proud of all of the artists. And when I say artists, I mean everybody, every musician, engineer, visually, um, you know, uh, my visual and graphic designer, Leanna Ringstead, who I've been working with for years on my website, my beautiful website, and with images and, you know, beautiful t photography of hers. Um, you know, she collaborated with uh, Rochelle Neely, who, this wonderful underneath the water beneath the surface photography is the name of By the company. way, and Terry, sorry for interrupting. Um, yeah. For those of you that are here with us in Studio Live on Fireside, if you look in the fortune cookie, you'll see Terry's website. It is a beautiful, beautiful website. And you can also find um, Terry's album on his website. And you'll see the front cover that was obviously the... Um, the thumbnail for this show. It's just this beautiful um, underwater picture of Terry diving, you know, with this guitar um, and sort of the flow of the water. It's just, it's just beautiful. And, and Terry, you had sent me the, um, the line that was written about, um, you sent it to me and I have it on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. um, but about you have to dive deep. Oh, I have it right here. I can read it. Please do. It's beautiful. In, in many ways, making this album has been an awakening for me. You have to dive deep before you surface with gratitude and attitude, Terry. That's the dedication to the record. But it was all of us that took the deep dive. Yeah. All of us. Um, and it was, uh, it was actually a phenomenal, a, a pivotal and phenomenal experience for me. Um, but each of the people who I speak to who are part of the album it, it had their version of that with them. It was a shared, it was a shared experience yeah. and not limited in any way by location. Right. Right. You know, so that became very interesting. Uh, so I'm really truly excited. And and there were there were no limits and no boundaries. What what was a very repressive um experience. Yeah, a collapsing experience for all of us right. became unlimited. Yeah. There were any, anything was possible. It's yeah. like, you know, if I want to have somebody sing who lives in Amsterdam, I email them. <laughs> <laughs> so different. You know, it's because so they're different. home. They're home too, trying mm. not to die and trying right. to, and trying to stay physically, spiritually, right. mentally, emotionally healthy. Right. You know, Absol and absolutely. So I don't No, There was nobody said that said no to doing this. Yeah. Everybody said, thank you to doing this. And, and could, because we were exchanging creativity together, we were really, 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 um, it, it became more of a collaboration than I ever could have dreamt possible. Mm, and I again, bet. I'm a big collaborator. I always leave room for the people who surround me to to be magnificent you know it doesn't mean i don't tell them what to play you know i'll write out a bass part but i won't write the whole song out they don't have to just read everything i'll write the idea i'll write the the verse and the chorus and yeah. then let them take it from there well, make again, it your, to your own. point you're working with professional the best of musicians, the best the, the best greatest. of the best and so you're handing them this is this is where i want you to go but you're going to put your own, you're going to craft this in your own special, unique, incredible way. I mean, you are dealing with the creme de la creme of the world yeah. of mm -hmm. musicians, literally. Um, and I asked them, I, I would anyway, if we were in the room live together, but I really would say to them, just like you and I are speaking to each other right now, make it your own. Right, right. And that, and that very much happened. It's a spectacular album. The songs 
are amazing. And uh, I you. am grateful that I get to listen to this um, anytime I want. It's so pretty. Um, listen, as we head towards the bottom of the hour, I just wanted to invite anyone here in studio with us. If you wanted to come up, make a comment, ask a question, um, or just do yourself a favor and go download it. It's just, it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's just, it's amazing. Um, if not, that is no problem. I'm saying I'm a lot. I think I'm just thinking about a lot of things because I've listened to the music and it's, mm -hmm. it's really, it's really, really, um, it's complex. Mm -hmm. It's there's layers. And I was telling, by the way, um, Chris, thanks for joining us. And before you and I started the show, I said, I was listening to it through really good headphones and you can hear the layers and the layers and the complexity of the music in the background versus if you were listening in your car, you're going to miss right. some of the, some of the movements. It's just, the music is just absolutely stunning. Thank so, you. um, anyway, uh, uh, Chris Rossetti, welcome to this conversation with Terry Woolman as he launches his new album surface to the planet. <laughs> welcome Chris Rossetti. Thank you so much. And, uh, two of my favorite people, not just on fireside, <laughs> but all of social media. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's always Chris. great to speak with you. You're welcome, Stephanie and Terry. What an honor, what a privilege, man, to learn the process even more. And I too fell in love with the cover art long before the release. And I, I messaged him and said, whoa, that's so cool. Yeah. And uh, wow, that was amazing. So um, before I go back to the stage or the audience or wherever it's called, can you tell me, Terry, um, what... What it's like after completing such a project, what it's like to think of the next step, because I know there's more notes there. I know there's more notes. So if you don't mind telling me if I haven't jumped the gun, Stephanie. Not at no, all. No, Chris, this is great. I think it's a Thank great you, question. Chris. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a great question. Well, I what's, haven't like stopped. What's, what's, what's coming up? We're so excited. We can't <laughs> wait to, to hear some more. <laughs> Whatever you got, man. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the question. I, I haven't stopped writing. I mean, once yeah. I was able to tap the well again, you know, fake it till you make it, you know, I just started and then I started being inspired by and motivated by the actual experience again. I had to force it at the beginning. Yeah. So I got back to writing. I'm still writing. I've got new songs that haven't been recorded yet. Uh, we are doing... I'm excited about this. Also, we are actually having a live album release performance uh, a, a week from tomorrow on August 26th at Vibrato, Herb Albert's Vibrato Grill in Los Angeles. Awesome. If, if anybody's in town, come join oh, us. So, awesome. so one of the things that I'm doing after this conversation today, after our interview, is getting the rest of the charts to the band and so that they can be prepared for our rehearsal later this week and awesome. or next week. And so there are performances coming up, uh, which I'm thrilled about to get to play this new music. And uh, and again, just more writing, more creating, you know, and and of course, um, an incredible amount of, of hours dedicated to getting the music out there. Yeah. You know, oh, getting for it sure. getting it out globally so that people can really enjoy it and experience sure. it. And yeah, share it's, it. it's, it's beautiful. Um, Terry, it's funny. I've been thinking about what came out of this album and, and the layers of the music and the sitar and all of that. And it's, I, what I thought was fascinating as I was, as I was really listening to this music, you know, we're living in a, a time now in our history where really geography doesn't matter anymore. And we're right. finding brand new ways to figure out how to make that happen, but also realizing it opens us up to a whole new talent um, um, of the in the world, whether it's music, uh, whether it's business, education, we just, boundaries are sort of like they've fallen apart out of yeah. force, right, during COVID. And it's interesting to me because I think there's this amazing opportunity through your music, as evidenced by some of the musicians you had collaborating, to create some spectacularly beautiful music that falls under that genre of what we call smooth jazz, but incorporating musicians and, and musical equipment that gives us a whole new depth and flavor and color 
to our notion of, oh yeah, that's a smooth jazz song. Oh yeah, that's a rock song. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. It's incredible. So are you, I know I asked you before, but now that you're talking about writing music in, are you, are you finding that you are writing music and you're thinking about incorporating instruments and musicians that you have never tapped into before? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And the, the opportunity, as I said, it's unlimited now. So I am not turning back on that. I, I awesome. just found it captivating. And, and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I believe in being a versatile artist. Um, it's worked against me perhaps, you know, or some people have, have suggested that it might work against me. Uh, you know, they'll say, pick one, you know, right. just be right. an, an acoustic guitar right. player right. or be an electric guitar player or right. stick in smooth jazz or only do R and B or pop, or why are you writing vocal tunes or, right. but that's never been me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a music director. I'm an arranger or producer. I play multiple instruments and, and I love all styles. I'm influenced as deeply for, by soul music and R&B music. Those, those are my earliest influences. You know, my first tour was playing with Billy Preston. Yeah. You know, and, and that was, some people would be surprised at that now, but that was like, that was sort of a give me because mm -hmm. that's what I came up on was that kind of funk R&B soul totally. music. And then of course, growing up in Miami, being exposed to, tropical, you know, oh. but, you know, um, Caribbean music and those flavors and yes. music from, from coming up from Spain and South America and Mexico and without even realizing it. So, so I've always had a world music, yeah, um, you know, some blood, world blood, you know, flowing yeah. through my veins musically that, that comes through when I'm just being authentically myself. So there was no reason for me to not include all of those styles and genres and mixing, you know, mixing things up. And, and it's, it's, I'm told a bold move, but I think it's musically a lot more interesting. You know, I might get more radio play if every song was like, pick a song, <laughs> you know, if it was like hipster or gratitude or an attitude and what is hip, you know, and not, not doing a song with a bunch of Indian musicians or a ballad, a pop ballad or a really funky R and B tune, determination with Ellis Hall, and I, you know, if you want, I can play a couple snippets so people get the idea. Yeah, I love the one with the sitar in the background. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Okay, so let me so let me just play a couple little pieces from from each section. So you heard gratitude and attitude, and what is hip? Here's hipster, and this is featuring Najee, and this was another one. It took a pivot because I had. Najee and I had spoken, we've known each other for years. We've played together on television and, and stages. And he, at one point had said, we should record a song together. And same thing with Andy Snitzer on what is hip, you know, we had done a project together. And so I said, oh, I've got a song for you. And he said, yeah, I'll play flute. And I said, not sax. And he said, no, I want to play flute. And I said, well, let me write a flute song for you. Let's, you know, so I, here's a song that wouldn't have existed if in this dialogue during COVID. Uh, so here's Hipster. I'll just play a few seconds of each. Najee on flute. And here's something interesting that wouldn't have happened if we did it live. There's no drums on this album. It's all percussion by Luis Conte. Because it was just an interesting way to approach it. Okay. That wouldn't have happened not during, you know, not during a, a shutdown. That's just Najee's an ocean and, yeah. a, and, a, and a beach. It's ocean air. It's a cocktail. It's, yeah. it's the cute little shack bar behind me. 
and it's, you know, roasting something on a fire by the beach and yeah. it's sunset and it's beautiful and it's white linen. Like I could just it gives you this whole, it's beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful. And I was inspired by Najee saying, oh, I'll play flim. I want to play flute. Right. And Najee lives in Florida. I grew up in Miami. Yeah. So this is what came it's of, perfect. of that conversation and then kicked it back to him. Here's Dancing in the Light, uh, which is my collaboration with Ricky Kesh that I had dreamt. <laughs> I would expect a sitar on one of my songs. So that's one that I, I actually, I started to write the melody completely by myself and then I thought, I'm going to take a big chance on this. I want to co-write the melody with with a friend of mine who lives in another continent and just see what happens. Yeah, cuz why not? It's either going to be a great idea or it won't work. It totally worked and it because again, something more happened because I didn't try to control it. Uh this has um uh, my wife Melanie Taylor on mm -hmm. vocals. In India, because I wanted an Indian vocalist, Shathra HG, and then Sumarani on sitar, Ravi Chandra Kular on flute, Karthik K on gatam and other Indian percussion, and then my musicians here, Abraham Laboriel bass, John Robinson drums, Luis Conte on percussion. And here's the funny part of the story. I wanted a choir at the end of the piece like at the end of a piece when a gospel choir comes in and, yes. and just the the skies, the heavens open up. Right. And I, But I wanted it to be Indian and that's what it was going to be until Ricky got nominated for his third Grammy with his album with Stuart Copeland, which he won. So he didn't have time to do it. And we were finally getting ready to mix the album. And I, I was reaching out to Ricky and saying, we're running out of time. Yeah. And he, he said, I'm so sorry, I'm not gonna be able to get this mm. done. Right. Next time. And I knew that I wanted a choir. So I wrote the vocal parts. I sang them here in my studio with Melanie. We doubled and tripled parts. And we needed another voice. I reached out to my friend Talik Olstead in Amsterdam. And we created a virtual choir. Never would have happened. Never would have Wouldn't happened. even thought to do that. We would have had three singers in the room or four, you know, and, and just laid it down. Um, and it's even more magnificent because of the story, it, because of, of the intention of what happened. I'll forward to the end where the, the, the choir comes in. Yeah. So here's where I want it to start to lift. How cool is that? And there's so there, cool. so that's probably not exaggerating. It's probably about a, a 23, 25 voice choir between the three of us. Cause we all lay down about eight to yeah. 10 parts each. Oh, so, you, so, so, so that we could have the, the that emotion the, of, right, of right. this choir come in. So Beautiful. never would have happened if right. 
if these conversations didn't happen and life didn't happen along the way, including not having an Indian choir. Right. This is, it still got me emotionally, you know, the same way. Like right. we, we achieve the intention of the song. Um, here's another little piece. I always like to write a solo acoustic guitar piece because my relationship with acoustic guitar is, is there's nothing to hide behind. You know, it's just wood yeah, and steel. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And and so I always challenge myself with writing a song uh, and playing it. So here's a little bit of a song called Jeté. So, and I truly challenge, challenge myself. I, I write whatever comes to me and then I need to learn how to play it <laughs> because just because I wrote it doesn't mean it's easy to play. So, um, but it's, they're beautiful challenges and I love the instrument. There's another song beautiful. that comes after that called This Day that I co-wrote uh, years ago with Lilouette Fox and it had been released in previous incarnations and my friend, artist Connie Jackson, asked during COVID if she could record the song. She wanted to release her first single. And she's toured with Phil Collins and is on TV as an actor, nonstop on all kinds of you know major shows. And, and uh, so we did this remotely for her and released the single version. And then I thought it might be a really nice fit to, to include the full version, uh, not the, the radio edit on this album, and Connie was gracious enough to, to let me include it. And this was something where she wanted a string quartet. And she was really insistent. And we did this whole thing remote as well, this whole thing, this piece. Um, so um, I wrote a cello quartet, and my friend Tina Guo, who's a world-renowned cellist, recorded these parts at home. We also had, uh, so it's Connie Jackson on vocals, Melanie Taylor on background vocals. Uh, Myself on guitars, Ron Walters on acoustic piano, Leland Scalar on bass, which was really a blast because Leland had toured with Phil Collins with Connie. So uh, we were putting Connie's dream band together, you know, for the, the recording of that. Uh, John Robinson, again, drums, Luis Conte, and, and then Tina Guo on cello. By the way, this whole album was mixed by Peter Kelsey, who I mix my records with, and, and this was mastered by Steve Hall. And part of the magnificence of the audio quality is due to, to Peter Kelsey. But think about this. Every one of these parts were, were self-recorded by musicians in their own studios, in, some of them in their bedrooms. And, but it still sounds like it was recorded at Capitol Studios, the whole record. Yeah, you here's, never know. Yeah. Here's a little bit of this day. Let me pull it up. This day is all we really have So let's live it to the fullest Every precious minute This day is filled with every Regrets to yesterday, feel the joy it brings. Pretty timely. This day, this day, this day, this precious day. Oh, this day, this day, every wish we ever made. 
answers this day. I never would have written a cello quartet. It would have been a string right. quartet, two violins, viola, and cello. This yeah. is so much more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's a song called Come on Erdell that is actually going to be, nobody's heard this yet. This is this truly is a world debut of this record. And it's really fun to have a listening party with you and our listeners right now. Uh, you were, were asking me how I was feeling about the album being released yesterday. I'm having a blast right now sharing <laughs> awesome. the music, you know, because I, I finally get to. This is a great uh, song. So Come On Erdell is going to be released as a radio single uh, next month. It's so good. Yeah. It was it's so good. <laughs> Now here comes the first key change. Here's an example. Another key change. the original key. Totally unexpected for me as a composer to move through three keys quickly. so quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and I was resisting it. You yeah. know, when it was happening, I was going, yeah. just stay, Terry, stay focused. Right. Keep your eye on the ball. Why are, you, right. why are you going? And then I just thought, let me just see where this goes. Love it. And that happened a lot on this record. On every level, every... Every experience, every awesome. conversation with every artist or every conversation with myself. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> in, right. In the creative process, right. whether it was me taking my guitar part out to feature Bob James because what he played was so spectacular, he right. didn't need me to play there. Right. So I took it out and added me back in. All of these things are part of the the magnificence for me of the experience. Yeah. Um, and and I think um, and I hope that everybody feels that when they're listening to the music. It's really so good. <laughs> that was a really fun one. Now here's another surprise. Here we go. Oh, this one's so good. Some of that drums in there, some of that bass. Determination featuring Ellis Hall. Dancing in my eyes, you fill my mind. Concentration strong as high, and knowing you're the one. You're the one. Destination well defined. Passion, favorite body language, something burning. Can you feel the heat? My rhythm flow. You so fine. Motivation, my life was seeming complete. Till I get to hold. Yes. I love that pop. It's that Prince pop. It's that Prince clap in the back. Yes. Right? Terry, Terry Lee, Jimmy Jam. It's that pop. Right. Pop. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's so cool. And by the way, the drummer on that song is is Jonathan Sugarfoot Moffat, who played with oh, both Madonna and awesome. Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So good. And featuring, and I co-wrote this with Ellis Hall, so the, the person who's singing the song. And by the way, He's also playing guitar. He and I are both playing oh, that's rhythm guitars. So and and awesome. most people know Ellis as a singer and a keyboard player. But he's just 
just so gifted and magnificent. And Ellis and I call this our high cholesterol, greasy <laughs> funk tune. <laughs> Terry, after this album has been all over the place, everybody knows about us downloaded. Terry, give us a funky album. Give us a funky, like, you know, or you just want to grit your teeth. like Do that funky. next. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I am so genuinely honored that you asked me to have this conversation with you today to sample some of the music that people can look forward to listening to on your brand new album surface, the incredible collaboration of the phenomenal musicians you reached out to who were happy to participate in the creation of this album with you. And I just, Tara, I wish you and all of your colleagues just the best of success and downloads and people really having an opportunity to enjoy this music around the globe and some artists who listen to the sitar, which is a very normal thing for them. And then to be able to hear the other musicians from the States participating with that music, I think is really fun. It's really fun as well. And I, um, this has just been a wonderful conversation. And again, I am for so- me as well so happy that you chose me to do this. Um, any parting thoughts after you launched yesterday? We've had this conversation today. How are you feeling? Any parting thoughts about kind of this album and getting yeah. it out into everybody and then, and then sort of like what's ahead for you? Uh, yes, I do. And, and thank you for, for hosting this conversation. There's nobody more in the world who I would have wanted to, to do this release with than you. You're the, the perfect absolute perfect person to do this because you're an artist, you are a thinker and a feeler and a, a dear friend and, and also peer of mine too. So I've been very excited. I've got different interviews coming up, but this is the one for me that, that I knew that we could actually deep dive together into the music. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and we can, we'll play out, we'll play this show out with the secret reprise after I answer the question, because that's kind of a nice little final yeah. touch to the record and, and could be to the conversation. Um, what I do want to encourage everybody to do and ask of you is to, if you are going to Spotify to stream, simply hit subscribe, hit the button. You have no idea how much impact that has on any artist's career. So it doesn't just hold for me. And I say this at the end of many of my podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe. Because that's the only way that artists are able to continue to put out music now and get royalties um, for you to hear music without any cost to you. And you don't get spammed and you don't get emails and you don't get, if you want to know more about me, sign up on my email list on my website. But but I encourage you to subscribe to every artist Spotify page who you like and want to support. It's a simple click of a button. Um, and I appreciate it. And, and we can see when the numbers go up because of you. And so that means the world to me and it makes it possible to continue to make records like this. Um, what's next? It's just getting out there in the world and starting to play live again. We've been doing it more and more. I'm definitely thinking about the next record and, you know, it's kind of funny because I was thinking about a dance record, like a like an in your face, put your foot in it, get people up on the floor. It's kind of a record. Put your and, foot in it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, since you know my career and and my art, I do what what is truthful to me and authentic. Yeah, and whatever comes out comes out, and this is a good reflection of that. Um, you know, it's a lot of different things, but it's all still me. It is all still me. And, and, and it brings me joy when I create music like this in all of these different styles, even if it, it, it might be challenging to divide, you know, define versus defy category, but you know, that's okay. That's okay. Because, because in bringing joy to me, it also is, I know that it brings joy to the people that I record it with and and it's not a complete experience until it's listened to and heard by you, Stephanie, and our listeners and people around the world so that it can touch them in some way and bring, make their life a little bit better in some way. That's the full circle 
of for me of creating music. It's not just recording it; it's releasing it. So we're at we're at the we're we're sort of at the it's it's all a payoff, but this is like the, the destination for me. You know, life is a journey, but this is a certain it's it's a place along the way that we know that we want to stop. We want to share it. We just want to share it and then keep on continuing to to be creative and inspire other people to be creative. So I um, that. as I end all of my podcast, I just encourage everybody to stay safe and to stay inspired. I like that. Stay safe and stay inspired. And before you play us out, um, I want to say thank you to those of you in the audience who joined us here live on Fireside. Um, we know you have a lot of choices as to where you can spend your precious time and you spent it here with us and we're honored by that. And for those listening off platform, thank you for joining us. And for those of you that might be listening to the replay on a podcast, we hope you enjoyed this conversation and got a, a great window into the soul and the creative process of Terry Woolman. Um, and I also want you to say hello to Melanie for me. Tell her I love I her. Will. Give her a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let you play us out with this very um, beautiful and personal song, um, uh, The Secret, that I think people will be hearing more about in a future podcast. Terry, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This is The Secret Reprise, which was just a little extra Scooby snack from, from the record that I wanted to share with everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, everybody, here live on Fireside. We will see you back here next time very soon. We appreciate it. Terry Woolman, be well. Say congratulations to all your fellow musicians. Thank and we you. will see you all here soon. What did you Good night, everybody. Thank you. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman. <laughs>